Hi, this is Professor Dorr, and this is lecture number four of EE310. And in this lecture, we're going to discuss the source-free parallel RLC circuit. In the last lecture, we discussed the source-free series RLC circuit, and the parallel is very similar to the series, so I'll go a little bit faster through this lecture. So if you don't pick up some of the concepts from this lecture, it might be worth going back to the series RLC because we did some things in a little bit more detail. Now before we get started, um, I want to point out that this is our source-free parallel RLC circuit. And I remember taking this class many years ago, and I looked at a circuit like this and said, why would I be interested in that? That circuit, there's going to be no energy in it. Um, so why, why, it's just going to sit there dead. But in reality, what we're doing here is we're going to use uh, voltage sources and current sources and switches and unit step functions to put initial conditions uh, into this circuit, meaning that we're going to have energy stored in the capacitor and or the inductor at t equals zero. And then at t equals zero, we're going to get a big thud or a boing. But at t equals zero, the source is going to get disconnected from the circuit. And that's why we call it a source-free parallel RLC circuit. So you remember what we talked about in our last lecture where we said that there, a circuit like this or any dynamic system can be described by a characteristic equation. And the characteristic equation is a, it describes the system itself. The characteristic equation um, describes the characteristics of the oscillation of the circuit, uh, but it doesn't say how loud it will be because that depends on how much energy was put into it. Like for example, I like to use my copper pipe in my lectures in class, and I take the copper pipe and I drop it, and it goes ding, and then I put it at a higher distance and I drop it and it goes ding, or uh, the bananas on the table here. If I drop the banana, I get a thud. If I drop the banana from a higher level, I'm still gonna get a thud. And that thud of the banana or the boing of the copper pipe is what the characteristic equation describes. It describes the vibratory properties of the circuit. So let's get the characteristic equation for this. And of course, we don't need any sources to get that because it doesn't have anything to do with the sources. So what we're going to do is we'll use KCL at the top node here. Or in other words, we're going to sum all the currents going into this node to zero. Let's do the hard one first because the current through the inductor is not plainly evident to us, or the expression for the current isn't. So what we do know is that for an inductor in any circuit, any topology, any time, um, a basic property of the inductor is V sub L is equal to L di dt. Holds for transient circuits, holds for AC steady state circuits, always works because it's what the physics and magnetics dictate. So I can get an expression for I by just moving the L under V sub L here and then integrating both sides. So I integrate V sub L over L and that is going to give me the integral of di dt or just I. So here we go. Our V was here, we integrate our V, here we divided by L. That's my expression for I sub L. So that was the hard one. Now let's do the easy ones. Uh, the resistor is just going to be V divided by R. And then our inductor, we just got that. It's gonna be one over L V 
uh, integral of V, and then plus, what's the current through the capacitor? We go back to its basic differential equation, and which is I equals C dV dt. So it's just going to be C dV dt. So great. I've got this single differential equation in one variable. Things are looking good. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the derivative of both sides. Of course, the derivative of zero is going to be zero. And I'm going to take the derivative and divide by the capacitance. So let's start off with this term. Take the derivative, and I have d squared v dt. Divide by the capacitance. I have d squared v dt. And now we have, for the resistor, take the derivative with respect to time of v sub t. And I have dv dt divided by r. dv dt divided by r. So this term is here. And now here, for this one, um, uh, now what I'm going to do is take the derivative of the integral, and I'm just going to get v. And of course, I've got my L under there. And remember, I divided by c, so I get my last term. So this term made that. This term made that. This term made that. So you might want to scratch those arrows into your notes. So in our last lecture, we derived a characteristic equation that looked really similar to this. It's not exactly the same, but we'll go into that, those differences in a bit. But what the smart people figured out many, many hundreds of years ago is that this second order linear differential equation has two solutions. And we know the form of the solutions. We don't know all the numbers, but we know the form. Those two solutions will be V equals A e to the ST. And there's going to be two of them. So since I kind of know what I know what the answer is going to look like. So let's put the answer back in the equation. Totally seems like we're going backwards here, but we're just doing what we got to do to solve this thing. So we know the, the answer is going to look like this. So let's substitute that V in here. So for what I know about this expression here, is if I take the derivative with respect to time, I'm going to just get s times a times e to the st. So if this is v, dv dt, I'm just going to move an s over here, and I have a e to the st multiplied by s. If I want to get the second derivative, I just take the derivative of this, which really means I just put another s over here, and this part remains the same. So d squared dt, d squared v dt, is equal to s squared a e to the st, and dv dt is s times a e to the st. We went into this in more detail in the last lecture, but you can see what we're doing. We can now substitute these expressions into our differential equation. The d squared v dt is going to go here. The dv dt is going to go here. And v, that's going to go here. So let's see what that looks like. Here it is with our substitutions. This differential equation becomes this algebraic equation. Life's getting easier when we go from calculus to algebra. So what I can see here is that I can factor out a e to the st from both sides. And that leaves me with s squared plus 1 over rc times s plus 1 over lc equals 0. And that is the equation that is given in your book. So. This equation describes the vibrational modes of um, 
that circuit. So now you remember that I said the characteristic equation for the parallel RL circuit is C is a little different than from the series RLC. Let's look at the two of them. So the series RLC and parallel RLC, okay, both have an S squared and both have a one over LC at the end. But here's the difference. It's that center term. For series RLC, we have R over L. For parallel RC, we have one over RC. So you have to be really, really careful about that when you do quizzes um, with series and parallel RC. Or in other words, you have to be able to look at the circuit and you have to figure out the topology. It may not be super obvious, but you'll have to go, oh, that's a parallel RLC circuit. So this is the characteristic equation I want to use. And let's look at how we use this equation. We're going to take our parallel RLC equation and let's find the roots with the quadratic formula. And I remember the formula negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac all divided by 2a. Uh, many students come into my class and they sing that awful little song that reminds them of the quadratic formula. And that's, that's cool too. But when we use the quadratic formula, here's what we get for the two roots. Of course, it's quadratic, so there are two roots, and that's why we have the plus or minus. And we are going to identify the toadstools in this uh, equation. If you're not familiar with the term toadstool, uh, that's a term that I use um, to describe the little landing places we have in engineering design and engineering formulas. Uh, just like a, um, an an um, a toad or whatever little critter in the pond is jumping from toadstool to toadstool, when we're doing these problems, we're going to jump from toadstool to toadstool. And one of your toadstools is alpha equals minus 1 over 2RC. And then your other toadstool is omega naught is equal to 1 over root LC. And that's why this is omega naught squared. So when you are working with a parallel RLC, you're going to say, oh, parallel RLC, alpha is 1 over 2 RC, omega naught, omega naught is 1 over root LC. And those are your told toadstools. So let's compare the series and the parallel RLCs again. So alpha is different for series versus parallel. Omega naught is exactly the same. And other than this, the analysis is all the same. Or in other words, um, the way we're going to get the transient response of this thing, it's the same way we did with the series RLC circuit. And you're going to see this in the next few examples. All right. So in this example, if you have the time, go on Blackboard and grab the LT Spice file. And you can actually see this get simulated. And you'll also see that I used one of my favorite engineering tools, which is Excel, and I plotted the response there also. But let's just take a look at this circuit. So we are asked to find V sub t for t is greater than 0. Oh, OK, there's V. And here, I didn't go out of my way to put the little plus and minus here showing exactly what V was. I said, here's V. And the implication is that is V with respect to ground. So I want to know what V of T is. And my strategy is going to be um, find V of T. Now, you might say, well, duh, that's what you're asked for, right? 
you're asked for V of T, so you're saying your strategy is to find V of T, but it's not always the same. Like for example, say I had uh, a resistor in series with this inductor, okay? So we're just gonna change the example for a little bit. And we're gonna say we have a resistor here, and I'm asked for the voltage across the resistor. Well, what I'm gonna really do is focus in on getting the current through that inductor, because that's what my differential equations are really gonna describe. So I might strategize that problem by saying, I need to get the current through the inductor, then I'll just multiply it by the resistance, and that'll give me the voltage across the resistor. So not always the same, that's why I say that. So we're trying to get V of T. So in order, we have a couple of things we need to do. First, well, not first of all, we can do them in either order. One of the things we need to do is we need to get V at zero plus. And then we need to get dV dt at zero plus, because that's gonna give us the constants A1 and A2 in our solution. Remember, we said our solutions have the form a e to the st, and there's two solutions, so we're going to have an a1 and an a2. And knowing the voltage at time equals zero and the derivative of the voltage at time equals zero is going to let us help us calculate a1 and a2. The second thing we need to do is we need to figure out the type of response that we're looking at. And that comes from the characteristic equation. Um, just like in the last lecture, do we have a thud, like dropping the banana? Do we have a boing, like dropping the copper pipe? Or do we have a thump, which is not really a thud or a th uh, boing, and it's actually called critical damping? But we need to figure out what that characteristic is, because that's going to tell us um, how to proceed through the rest of the, um, of the analysis. So it looks like here I chose to deal with the initial conditions first. And since what I need is V at zero plus and DV DT at zero plus, let's go after those. So what I see is that the inductor is a short circuit at DC. So um, it's going to have some current through it um, at t equals zero minus. So at t equals zero minus, I have zero volts here, right? And I have no current through the capacitor because the capacitor does not conduct current at steady state. And I have no current through the resistor because there's zero volts across it. So, but I can have all the current I need through this inductor. So we know the voltage is zero here. So the voltage is zero over here also. And remember at T equals zero minus the switch is closed. So the current is gonna be six divided by 10 or six minus zero divided by 10. And that's going to give us 600 milliamps. And it's not going here. It's not going here. It's all going here. So that tells me what this inductor current is. But before we use that, let's do something else. Let's get V at zero plus, because that's really easy. We just said that at zero minus, the voltage across the inductor is going to be zero. That's one of our rules. And that also means the capacitor voltage at zero minus is going to be zero. So at T equals zero plus, we can't change that capacitor voltage quickly. So V at zero plus is going to be zero. So 
That's why I say the capacitor voltage equals the inductor voltage equals zero at T equals zero minus and T equals zero plus. Now let's get dV dt for the capacitor. And we know that for the capacitor, I is equal to C dV dt. And so what I really want to know is what's the current through that capacitor at T equals zero plus. We know there was no current at T equals zero minus, but it can change quickly. That is one of our rules. So let's just look at what's going to happen. At T equals zero plus, the current in the inductor cannot change quickly. That's one of our rules. We also know the voltage here is not going to change quickly. So therefore, at T equals zero plus, I'm going to have zero volts right here for V. That's what we just calculated. So that means we have no current through the resistor because the voltage across it is zero. So let's do KCL on the fly. I got no current here at T equals zero plus because the switch is open. I got no current here at zero plus because there's no voltage. But I know that I'm going to have my 600 milliamps going down through this inductor at zero plus because I can't change that current quickly. Where's it going to come from? It's not going to come from here. It's got to come from the capacitor. So all the current comes from the capacitor and the capacitor current is going to be minus 600 milliamps. So now I can say I equals C dV dt. So dV dt is I over C is minus 0.6 over 1 microfarad is minus 600,000 volts per second. So that's dV dt at zero plus. Those were a lot of steps. Let's, let's just kind of go back again and look at how we did that. How did we know what to do? So I knew that we were going to solve for V. We're going to solve for V. And V is the same all the way up here. And so in order to get my my A1 and A2, I'm going to need V at zero plus, and I'm going to need dV dt at zero plus. Let's get V of zero plus easily, because I know that at zero minus, the voltage across the inductor is going to be zero. Well, that means the voltage across the capacitor is going to be zero. And I can't change that voltage across the capacitor quickly. So V at zero plus is zero, period. Now I need dV dt. Well, do I know anything about how am I going to get that? Um, am I going to get it from the resistor? Well, I don't really know any dV dt formulas that work for the resistor. And for the inductor, nah, I got a di dt formula, but nah, I don't think I want to use that. Oh, for the capacitor, I have a formula that uses uh, D, uh, dV dt. Or in other words, I equals C dV dt. So I'm going to go here. I'm going to use this. And so in order to get dV dt, I really just need the current in the capacitor at time equals zero plus. And so then I know that all I need, I know that there's going to be no current here no current here because there's no voltage at time equals zero. So all that current that was going this way through the inductor at time equals zero minus is now going to keep going the same way through the inductor, but it's going to go he this way. It's going to come out of the capacitor. And I go back to my rules and my rules say um, I can change the voltage through, sorry, the current through the capacitor quickly. And I'm happy because I can go down all my rules and they're all satisfied. So remember I said we had to do two things, not in any particular order. 
One of them is we had to get our initial condition stuff, which we just did. The other is we have to get um, the, the form of the response. And remember that comes from the characteristic equation, but we have some pretty nice toadstools of alpha and omega naught that are gonna help us do that quickly. So before I move on, I'm gonna kind of put a little box around my two initial conditions because I'm gonna need those later. So now let's determine the type of response. So I show here alpha is one over two RC, but I kind of skipped a step. I need to figure out what kind of circuit I'm working with. So at T equals zero plus, this is open and all I'm left with is this. And I see the resistor and the inductor and the capacitor in parallel. And I go, that is a parallel RLC circuit. What does that tell me? That tells me which formula to use for alpha, because remember those toadstools are a little different. So I throw in my formula and I get alpha equals one over two RC. And that formula right there, that's on your cheat sheet. Don't mess around with that characteristic equation on the exam. Pull this off your cheat sheet. So alpha is 50,000. And then our next toadstool is omega naught. It's one over root LC. It's 31.6 thousand. And alpha is greater than omega naught. So it's over damped. And the equation for our response is given right here. Now, this statement here, we went through this in quite a bit of detail in the last lecture. So if you don't understand this, go back and look at that last lecture. Um, because what it really went to is the discriminant of the characteristic equation. Um, but the way I like to remember this, and this is about as dumb as that little quadratic equation song that you guys like to sing, but I call my alpha my thuddiness measure, and I call omega naught my boinginess measure. And if alpha is greater than omega naught, I got a thud because it's more thuddy than it is boingy. It's overdamped. And if alpha is less than omega naught, then that just means that it's more boingy than it is thuddy. And that just kind of helps me with these, so hopefully it'll help you too. Now, I, I'd like to, once I have my, I know that it's over damped, I'm gonna write my equation for the response. And I could say that V of T, because that's what we're looking for, is going to be A1 e to the S1t plus A2 e to the S2t. But I used R because I like to re remind you guys, R doesn't stand for remind, it stands for response, that the response for any, any overdamped circuit is going to look like this. And by response, it could be a current, it could be a voltage, it could be um, a pressure, it could be a, um, all kinds of fun stuff. It could be the position of the back of the car when I push down and watch the shock absorbers um, equalize. So this equation, I'm gonna go into this just a little bit more. This equation, would cover the voltage here, the current here, or same voltage, it could be the current here. It could be the current here. It'd have different constants in it for A1 and A2, but S1 and S2 would be the same because they are characteristics of the circuit. So that's kind of an important thing. So I used R, but then I quickly said, okay, what I really care about is the voltage. And I'm gonna do this problem the long way. I'm gonna say, here is my, my basic expression. And 
I know the voltage at time equals zero. So if I substitute time equals zero, my E's become ones. And I follow this little arrow down and I say V zero plus equals A one plus A two. V zero plus, we put a box around it. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take the derivative of my basic response here and that is going to be a1 s1 because I'm taking the derivative with respect to time e to the s1 t plus a2 s2 e to the 2 t and I'm going to substitute zero into that time equals zero so dv dt at zero plus is going to be a1 s1 plus a2 s t hey dv dt at zero plus one of the things we said we needed. We put a box around it. So I look at my two equations and I got uh, my dv dt at time equals zero. I got my v at time equals zero. I got my s1. I got my s2. I got two equations and two unknowns. I can solve this. So here they are. Now, what I want you to do is have these equations all ready to go. Let these be one of your toadstools. Don't derive this on a quiz. Know that you have an overdamped circuit and just pop these two equations out. So we put these equations in matrix form and we, sorry, we didn't have S1 and S2 when we were here, my apologies, but S1 and S2 are easy to get. Here they are. It's just minus 1 over 2RC, that's alpha, uh, plus or minus alpha squared minus omega naught squared. In fact, let me show you where this is so it doesn't look like math that just appeared out of nowhere. It's right up here. So alpha, alpha squared minus omega naught squared. Use those toadstools, the math gets easier. So use it. Okay, now we got everything we need to calculate A1 and SA2. Here's our matrix. This is the thing that I like to have on my cheat sheet. And you notice, as long as I'm consistent with S1 and A1 and S2 and A2, I'm always going to get the right answer. And I solve, um, here's where I solve for S1 and S2. I put them into the matrix. I get A1 and A2. And I just write down the answer because this is this. I just put in my A1, my A2, my S1, my S2. And you can see those implementations um, on Blackboard. Now, you've got the right answer. And around finals time, students will be working my practice finals, and I don't give the solutions for those. And they'll say, hey, professor, I got minus 7.75 e to the minus 11 blah, 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 t plus 7.746 times blah, blah, blah for your exam problem one. Is that right? And I don't tell them because there you can check this. I want you to have the confidence to quickly check your answer so you can say, Boy, I am pretty, I am very sure that that's right. I'm not going to think about that problem anymore and I'm going to move on to the next one. So you want to be able to check it. How would I check this? Here's what I do. I know what V of zero plus is, right? We figured that out up here. We said it's zero. So just substitute zero in. Well, let's see if I substitute zero in. 
my E's both become ones and I'm minus 7.75 plus 7.75 looks like zero to me. So that worked. And then what I might do is take a quickie derivative here. So, okay, the derivative of this thing, it's easy. I don't need the chain rule or anything like that. Um, I just um, move my 11.27 e to the minus three down here. And then again, I substitute in zero and I better get my dv dt at zero plus. And if I've got those two things, um, I can actually do one more thing. Let's do one more check. Let's look at the circuit here. Remember how we start off at steady state, we get up to t equals zero, and then we get a big push and it's a thud or a boing, and then we go to steady state. What's v at steady state <laughs> at um, time equals infinity? So we got up to t equals zero. In this case, we can thud, and then we waited for a long time after thud. What's the voltage at infinity? Just think about that for a second. t equals infinity is a steady state condition. So steady state, you got no voltage across the inductor. Now, you notice how I knew the component to go to. I didn't go to the resistor. I didn't go to the capacitor, because for the capacitor, I know I have no current at steady state. But that's not really helping me. Um, but I know I got no voltage across that inductor. That's all I need. So if I, if I go back to checking my equation, if I substitute infinity in there, I better get zero. Here's our beautiful little equation. And let's put in a gazillion for t. e to the minus 11.27 times a gazillion, that's zero. e to the minus 88.73 times a gazillion, that's zero. So v is zero. So I checked v at zero. I checked v at infinity. I checked dv dt at zero. They all work. I don't have to ask my professor whether um, I did this properly. Let's move on to our next example. So this example, we want to find I of t. Better be able to find it up here. There it is, I of t. And let's see, is this a source-free circuit? Forget about whether it's series or parallel. Is it source-free? Yeah, because at t equals zero, I open that switch, and there is no source in here, is there? So now we have to determine the topology type, but we don't recognize this topology, topology because I have this four ohm and five ohm resistor kind of going out into the middle of nowhere. So that's weird, I don't like that. The other thing I'm not liking about this is that I'm being asked for the current going down through this resistor, and it's not an energy storage element. It doesn't have a differential equation that describes it, but I know that it takes differential equations to describe all of this stuff. So I'm a little uncomfortable with this. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to just work with it a little bit. And at this point, I'd like to introduce you to another concept that is not specific to this problem, but it's one of the coolest concepts that I use for problem solving. And here's the deal. When I look at a problem like this, I'm just as baffled as you are. I know you're baffled when you look at these problems. Um, I don't care who you are. I, I've known enough of you over the, the years that I know you're baffled. I am too. I go, huh? I gotta figure it out. I don't know it. And if I were that professor who got up to the board and just vomited out the problem for you, you wouldn't learn anything. 
You wouldn't learn anything if I did that. So when I do problems for my students, I like to accept the fact that when I first look at it, I'm baffled because I know you're baffled. And going from baffled to unbaffled is how you solve problems. And so I like to take walks on the beach with my wife. And we'll usually go up to Moonlight Beach in Encinitas. And while my wife is watching the waves, I'll sometimes be watching the seagulls over by the garbage cans. And what the seagulls do, what the seagull does, is seagulls just pecking through those bags of garbage. Seagull finds a McDonald's bag, and he just starts pecking at it. And that seagull doesn't know whether he's going to find some french fries or whether he's going to find a half-eaten burger. Uh, maybe a bad day. There may be a dirty diaper in that McDonald's bag, right? So the seagull doesn't really know what he's going to find. But he knows he's going to use his intuition. Some of those McDonald's bags smell better than others, and the seagull kind of knows if you're pecking and the french fry smell starts getting stronger, you keep pecking. But if it's starting to smell like a dirty diaper, nah, don't peck that one. Go find another bag. So the seagull's using his intuition, and he's just kind of trying. Now let's look at how we solve problems. When I get these problems, or any problem, and I don't care how complex it is, what I do is I just start writing down things that are true. I start writing KVL equations. I don't even have a strategy, but I start writing some KVL equations. I write some KCL equations. I might um, combine some components to make the topology look different. I might notice that I have a, a source that looks like a Thevenin source, and I'll convert it to a Norton source to just see if it looks easier. Because I'm doing just what the seagull does. I have no idea what I'm doing, but the equations that I'm writing are true. And so when eventually what happens is I write enough equations and I look at it enough that I go, oh, duh, this is really easy. Or I say, hey, I've got um, four equations in four unknowns. I can solve that. And that's how I find my French fries. So you'll see that when I do problems like this, I'm not going to just vomit out the solution for you. We're going to triage them and we're going to talk about them and we're going to look at strategies for how you solve them because that's the way you're going to learn to get good at this. So I'm going to talk about the seagull a lot this semester. Um, I named my amplifier company uh, the seagull. It's called the seagull amplifier. It's no more complicated than that. Just looking for French fries out on the beach. So let's go back to this problem. In this problem, I got some things I don't like. I got a weird little wart sitting off here, and I'm asked for something strange. I'm asked for the current in this resistor, and it doesn't even have differential equations describing it. And I don't even see a series or parallel RLC like I did up earlier in the lecture. So what's a seagull going to do? First thing is let's combine these. These resistors are in series, and there's like nothing between them, right? And we're not asked to find the voltage between them or anything, so let's just combine them. Looks like 9 ohms to me. What else can we do? I've got 9 ohms going from here over to here. Well, isn't that just 9 ohms going to ground? We can make that look easier. Let's take our 9 ohms and just make it go to ground like that. So here it is. 4 ohms plus 5 ohms gave me 9 ohms, and notice how I just moved the topology around. So I'm still not there. It doesn't look perfect like a parallel RLC, but it will when I say, as far as the dynamics of the circuit go, I can combine these two resistors, 
and I have a four and a half ohm resistor. So as far as all the currents and voltages bouncing around in this thing, this looks like a four and a half ohm resistor and it's in parallel with a C and it's in parallel with an L. So I got a parallel RLC circuit. Okay, so I'm being asked for the current in this nine ohm resistor. So I gotta be careful because I know I'm gonna combine these into a four and a half ohm resistor, but I gotta make sure that I get the current through just one of them. I'm just triaging, I'm just thinking about this thing. So what we'll do is we're asked for I, but you know what I'm gonna solve for? I'm gonna solve for V up at the top because that's what we've been solving for with these parallel RLCs is the voltage up at the top. And after I get V, I'm gonna say I is just V over nine. See that? And you might remember on our last problem, we were asked to find V and our strategy was, oh, find V. Well, here I'm saying we're asked to find I, but by looking at the circuit, I say, you know, I'm gonna find V and then just divide it by nine at the end. And that'll just make the problem easier for me. So just like I said up here, they're not always the same. See that? All right, so I think I got my strategy nailed down. And so I'm gonna solve for V of T up here. So I need two things from initial conditions land. I need V at zero plus, and I need dV dt at zero plus. So let's see what happens. Um, at T equals zero minus, the voltage across the inductor and the, therefore the voltage across the capacitor is zero. Let's look. T equals zero minus. The rule that I'm gonna pull out of my bag says no voltage across the inductor. So that means this whole thing's sitting at zero volts. Switch is closed. Since this is at zero volts, I got no current in the, in the, in the resistors. I know I got no current in the capacitor because that's one of our rules. So all that current has to be going through the inductor. How much current? 24 minus zero divided by 12 is two amps. So here that is. So I also know that at T equals zero plus, the capacitor voltage can't change quickly. So that means that V at zero plus equals zero. That's one of the things I need. Now I need dV dt. Let's look. Very similar to our last problem because when the switch opens, I know that the capacitor is going to keep the voltage at zero at this node. That means I got no current through these resistors because I got no voltage across them. And I got no current going through here. So KCL on the fly says no current here, no current down here. That means no current here. So that means that this current is equal to this current because I got nothing here. And I know that my inductor current is going to be two amps at T equals zero minus. So at T equals zero, it's still going to be two amps. But instead of coming from this path, it's going to slurp it right out of that capacitor. So I know the capacitor current at T equals zero plus. I know that V equals, sorry, I equals C dV dt. So I can get dV dt at zero plus. That's one of the things I need. So capacitor current is minus two amps. So I is equal to C dV dt. So dV dt 
is equal to I over C is 2 over 0.037 is 54.05 volts per second. So in the last problem, I put a box around these rascals. Here I just summarize them. I said the voltage, I said across the inductor, same voltage as the capacitor, right? Voltage at zero plus is zero. DV dt at zero plus is minus 54.05 volts per second. Now let's determine the response type. We know we have a parallel RLC. So let's use our toad stools because they're right there on our cheat sheet. Alpha for a parallel RLC is 1 over 2 RC is 3. Omega naught is equal to 1 over root LC is also 3. So my thuddiness coefficient is equal to my boininess coefficient. So I get a thump, or mathematically, it's critically damped. Critically damped is one of the... Um, one of the response types from our previous lecture. And here is that response. It's going to be A2 plus A1T e to the minus alpha T. Um, let's do it the hard way one more time. At T equals zero, then V is just equal to A2, that's zero, and that's 1. So at t equals 0 plus, this is 1, this is 0, my response is just a2. So a2 is just b at 0 plus. And now, looks like we're not going to do it the wrong way. Eh, we kind of are. Um, if I take the derivative of this expression, of course, I'm going to get a couple of, I'm going to actually get three terms, right? Because I'm going to have one from this term multiplied and then add two here from the chain rule. So um, looks like I didn't do all that here, but we find that A1 is equal to dV dt plus alpha times A2. And A2 was equal to zero, because we just found it. So A1 is minus 54.05. Substitute that in here. And here is our equation for V at T greater than zero. So let's check the result before we convert it to I. Because remember, what we solve for is the voltage up here, and our strategy is at the end of the problem, we're gonna divide this by nine to get our current right here. Something else I should point out here is that um, R is equal to 4.5 ohms, because 4.5 is nine in parallel with nine. So as far as the big party going on here at t equals zero plus, I got four and a half ohms. But remember, I was asked for the current through this nine ohm resistor. Make sure you're good with that. If you're not good, perfectly good thing to ask me to go through it off sour, and I'll be glad to do it. So let's check our result before we convert it to I. Now, do we check the result by saying, hey, professor, did I get the right answer? No. Do we do it by going to Chegg and going, oh, I got the right answer, great, and moving on? Or do we go to Professor Thor's homework solutions, which just about everybody has? Uh-uh, we check it. And so we'll use the same checking strategy we did before. Here's our equation that we just got. I know that by looking at the circuit, um, V at zero plus was equal to zero. Let's substitute that in our equation. Ooh, I got a T here. So that's a zero. So V of zero is equal to zero. I love it. I'm okay so far. We know from looking at our circuit before that DV dT at zero plus was equal to minus 54 volts per second. So let's take the derivative of our equation that we got 
up here. It's not that hard. We just use the chain rule and we get, first we take the derivative of this times this, and then we take the derivative of this times that, and here's what we get. And we substitute in zero and we get a zero because we have a t here and our exponential turns into a one and check it out we got minus 54.05 volts per second we like that because that's what we know so now let's look at this circuit one more time because i want to know v at t equals infinity now take a look at this use all the rules and I'm going to give you just a second. At t equals infinity, we are again in steady state. So that means we got no voltage across this inductor. Done. V equals zero. So let's take our equation. Um, which is right up here, and let's substitute time equals infinity. Should be easy. And we do that, and the limit as t goes to infinity of 54.05 times e to the minus 3t is, let's see, that's going to infinity, this is going to zero, infinity times zero, or we could say that this is really just minus 54.05t divided by e to the 3t, right, plus 3t if it was downstairs. And, oh, here I did it. We got infinity over infinity. So at this point, what we do is we pull a mathematical tool out of our toolbox. And I believe, just to digress just a little bit, in our first lecture, I talked about math being a set of tools in the engineer's toolbox. I love mathematics, but to me, all the things I know about mathematics, be they calculus, be they L'Hopital's rule, be it Z transforms or Laplace transforms or Bessel functions or series, I use series a lot in my work. Those are all tools sitting in my little red toolbox over there. And I try to be a craftsman and just pull the right one out at the right time. And L'Hopital's rule, they didn't teach you that just to teach you more math. Um, they taught you that because it's a really useful thing. And right now it's going to save our butts because we have minus infinity over infinity and we need to know the limit. So what we'll do is we'll just take the derivative of the top with respect to t and we just get a 1. And we take the derivative of the bottom with respect to t, and we get 3 to the minus 3t. And we substitute in t again, we got 0. And remember, 0 is what the circuit was telling us. So good stuff. Uh, v at 0, the circuit and the math matched. dv dt at 0, circuit and the math matched t equals infinity, the circuit and the math matched, plus we got to pull a little cool tool out of our toolbox, and I just think that's really fun. I think that's really cool. So I'm good with that v. All we got to do now is divide that v by 9 ohms to get the i that we needed. i sub t equals v of t over 9. Uh, 54.05 is really equal to 54. So 54 divided by 9 is minus 6t e to the minus 3t. Check out the LT Spice circuit um, on Blackboard. Um, downloading LT Spice is really easy. Just look it up on the internet. Go to the Analog Devices website. It's a free download. It will, it's been available for 20-some years. It's always been available. It probably always will be available. Um, I use the heck out of it. Um, and 
I gave you this problem as an example because th doing the little switches and stuff can be kind of tricky. So I just wanted to show you how. So take a peek out of it, at it. All right, and that is the end of this lecture. Um, hope to see you all in office hour. And uh, other than that, I will see you in the next lecture.